Okay, good. So, as I was mentioning, so this is the ProV satellite. This is what we're generally using for our um, input for the time series. It has four bands, green, red, near infrared, and shortwave infrared. It's a very tiny CubeSat. It's like this size, not really big. It's much smaller than what you would expect from things like Landsat and Sentinel-2 and things like that. But it is very useful because it has a very frequent revisit time. So it covers each point on the world in one or two days. And it has 100 meter resolution for one mode that it has, because it actually has these three cameras. The middle camera captures things at 100 meter resolution. And then there's two sideways cameras. And then from those, we can get a 300 meter resolution product with a wider swap. Um, so this is the input for our models then. It gets uh, a bit cleaned up. So there's geometric correction, there's atmospheric correction. The cloud masking by default was not that good at the time. So it was improved in our, um, in our projects to be a bit better. Then we get from that the so-called ProBoV UTM ARD. So everything is made into the UTM grid and uh, it is analysis ready data in the sense that it is uh, cloud free. Then after that, we also have an additional data cleaning and compositing step um, where the clouds are removed directly. And then we also have a bit of uh, um, temporal outlier cleaning. So if we have uh, places that are not marked as a cloud, but there's still an outlier in the time series, that's very possible that we just missed it. So then the time series is used to um, remove those outliers. And then the result from that is the so-called ProV ARD plus. From there, we have uh, data fusion. So as I mentioned, we have the 300 meter product and 100 meter product. So they're fused together into a 100 meter product, which means that in the cases that we have missing data in the time series from the 100 meter product, we fuse in the data from the 300 meter product and um, in some cases that may also not be enough because there might still be missing data even in 300 meter product due to the clouds, for example. And then in this case, we also do some additional infilling using um, some extra uh, techniques. So it's, yeah, it's uh, using a common filter to fill it in spatially and also depending on uh, harmonics that is uh, modeled on top of the data. And then if there's a big gap, then we just assume that the harmonics will follow the same general harmonics trend as, as it was before and after. And out of that, we get the so-called ARD++, which is an infilled product where we don't have any clouds and we have no missing values. So then the machine learning algorithms that do not handle missing values can also uh, use this data. And out of that, we generate metrics. So that means that we have uh, a lot of spectral metrics, textual metrics, and the surface statistics. So the usual things like NDVI, NERV, um, NDMI, and also a lot of the textual metrics. So it also looks in the vicinity to tell what the texture is in the surrounding areas, and then min max and other distributed statistics. Um, and out of that, we get the training data. So in the areas where we had validation data collected from GeoWiki, it gets sampled and the metrics get extracted. Um, we also have some additional ancillary data sets that we are also using as uh, some extra covariates. So that includes the topography, the um, terrain metrics, water products and biome clusters. Um, so all of this together gets put into a random forest model. And actually these are two models. One is a classification model from which we get the, um, the land cover map that is with discrete classes. And then we also have a regression model from which we get a list of all the different land cover classes that we have in fractions. So the output is basically for each rank of our class, how much percent each pixel um, has of this class. 
Then in addition to that, we have uh, some extra steps. So we have classification results at the top, we have regression results at the bottom. The regression is post-processed somewhat because uh, there can be some things that are not really reasonable. We have some expert rules for that. For example, if it says that there are trees in the very far north, that probably is not true. So we just set that to be something other than trees. Um, and then in the end, we have uh, these products, the classified discrete map and the cover fraction layers. And then from these, we get the quality layers. Um, we uh, look at the random forest outputs so that we know how reliable the predictions are from how the individual trees were predicting. And we're using that as a proxy to see how reliable the information may be. So that's also one thing that is going to be included in the third collection of the map. And in addition, there's also going to be this additional part of uh, line cover chain detection, but that is something that I will cover in the second part. And just uh, quickly to mention that we have a step where we're using BFAST to detect whether there has been disturbance in the time series. If there has been, then it's reasonable to try and uh, see what's the difference between a map classified by a random forest in one year versus on another year. And then to compare whether the pixel values are different. And also there's a lot of expert rules to say whether such change is possible. So for example, it's not very likely that let's say urban gets changed into water because they're similar um, land cover classes, so it's easy to confuse them, although it does happen sometimes. And from all of this, we're using open source software, as I mentioned. So the entire processing chain is run in Python. The main tasks of machine learning are then using scikit-learn. And of course, GDAL is used for reading the input and writing out the output. Um, we're also using a bit of R, of course, as I mentioned, because uh, BFAST is implemented mainly in R. So it's actually running an R script from Python using RPy2. And then afterwards, we also have uh, this problem of uh, needing to run this over the entire globe. So to uh, handle that, we have an entire cluster and it's called Terrascope. Previously, it was called the Public B Mission Exploitation Platform. It is a big cluster that is uh, hosted by Vito, and they have um, something around 1,200 cores that they um, allow accessing for these sort of applications. It's running Apache Spark. So, effectively, we need to create a Spark ready program. So, using Python or R, that's both fine. And uh, with specifications to Spark, how much memory we need for that task, and uh, what is the input, what is the output, then this is sent to the cluster, and then the cluster um, runs all of it on the tiles that we specify. And the results are then seen through Elasticsearch and Hue, where it can find whether something went wrong. If it did, then why it went wrong, or if everything is good, then which processing has been completed, how fast is this going, and so on. So a bit more about the reference data that we're using. It's quite a lot of data, actually. So we are splitting our data into training data and validation data. And those are completely separate data sets. The training data set is collected by IASA. It is a much bigger data set, so it's over 150,000 points. And as I mentioned, in every pixel, we have fraction data. So then we know exactly what is there, even in the subpixel scales from the PubLP pixels that we're using. And the validation data is over 21,000 points that is collected here at Wageningen. And it is using the same methodology. It is using the same descriptions for what classes are. So the legends are the same, but it is by different groups of experts and the experts are also trained by different groups, which means that there is no um, bias in the sense. And you can even see that 
the coverage sometimes a bit different. For example, the, um, the Caspian Sea is not really collected by EASA, but it is collected by Rockingham and so on. So the first topic and the topic of this session is the global length of refraction mapping. Here you can see an example of the cover layers that uh, the project is providing. And this is uh, what I was also working on, trying to figure out what kind of machine learning algorithm is the best for doing these uh, predictions of length of refractions. Yeah, so that was uh, the goal of uh, the first paper that I wrote and just recently submitted. And here you can see um, my processing chain. Uh, I use a lot of different covariates. So I use also the POV archive. It was at 100 meter resolution. And then I use as additional covariates soil grids for soil information, ASTER for height information, and WorldClim for climate data. Out of all these, I preprocessed it. I got the different metrics. Then I had a separate covariate selection part because I wanted to compare both machine learning methods that are um, nonlinear, non-parametric, as well as linear models. So in order to avoid collinearity issues, I needed to select covariates that are not too, um, too collinear. And then out of that, we got, so we got down from around 300 covariates down to about 80 something, 81 or so. Um, and then afterwards, there was sampling at the training locations, validation locations, as well as at a global grid of 0 0.2 degrees. And then in those areas, we um, first for the training locations, we use the data from all those covariates and the training locations for the model training. Uh, for, for the validation data, we use that for, uh, for validating the model predictions to see how well the models do. And then lastly, for the 0 0.2 degree grid, we use that to create a wall-to-wall -wall prediction raster for the whole group. And then in addition to that, I was looking at another problem with uh, the models. And this is a problem that is very specific to length of refraction mapping. So here you can see an example of what could a pixel look like. Let's say we have um, about two thirds covered by herbaceous vegetation, so grass and such. And we have say a tree line in the middle. So 33% of this is trees. And you can see the problem here that in length of refraction mapping, we need to know what is the fraction of every single length of class in every single pixel, which means that the data that we get from this area is there's 67% herbaceous, 33% trees, and it's 0% water, 0% shrubs, 0% built up, 0% crops, and so on and so forth. So basically two things have values other than zero, everything else is zeros. Which means that our training set is very zero inflated. So I also tried to tune the models to account for the zero inflation that is inherent in such uh, Blank cover fraction mapping. And then I also compared uh, the covariate importance so that we know out of the covariates that were left after player selection, which ones were useful and the most important. Then in the end, they made the global line cover map and checked the errors. So yes, a bit more about the model input. Um, so the vegetation instances that we chose were in DVI, EVI, and DMI. Near V, it per, maybe not everyone is familiar with that one yet. It is near infrared of vegetation and it is a modification to NDVI that seems to be a bit uh, closer to predicting um, plant productivity compared to plain NDVI. And it does not oversaturate quite as much as well. And Asavi, the optimized soil adjusted vegetation index. Um, and for spectral covariates, we also used information from the time series. So I also plotted or yeah, I modeled the harmonics. Uh, and from the harmonics, I extracted the phase and amplitude for the different harmonic orders. 
So from those, we also use the information from the time series. Here we did do an assumption that line cover doesn't really change over time and that the time series is stable. Um, but this is something that in the future research, I will also uh, look a bit more into. But generally, line cover change is not that common. So probably not that many um, training data would be changed over time. And I used the entire archive of the ProV satellite, which is a lot of images. So the archive started in 2014, and I used everything until today or when the research was done, which was maybe like half a year ago. So at the time, I was using the composites, but they're five day composites, and that's still a lot of data. So for every pixel, I would need to analyze 386 images to get the time series. And since I wanted to get this global wall to wall map, that means that I had to extract data from every single imagery, every single image from the uh, entire probe of satellite archive. And that actually took a lot of time to do just the extraction of the data. And then, yeah, for Terran, I calculated the slope, roughness, Terran position index, and other things that are related to that. Um, for climates, I got, of course, the temperature. Um, Worldclim has information for every month. So I also did um, some statistics for the annual temperature, precipitation, and so on. And also I added some additional covariates that were not there. For example, what is the um, temperature of the wettest month? What is the temperature of the coolest month? And things like that. As well as look at, at uh, additional months, like specifically to the uh, January or July and things like that. And then I also use soil information. So I extracted um, information that was uh, continuous, so such as soil organic carbon, bulk density, and so on. I did not use the classification of soils because I'm trying to predict something that is regression and it would not give us more information anyway than the individual soil metrics because in fact, the soil classification is also made by using a machine learning model from the uh, soil metrics. And there, since Solgris has a lot of different depths, I selected by doing some pre-analysis um, that the immediate subsoil layer is the one that allows us to differentiate between the different land cover types the best. So I used the category that layer. So as I mentioned, this is a big data challenge. It's a global data set. Um, and we're trying to upscale now even more from 100 meter to 20 meters it's going to be an even bigger data challenge. And we have this movement dimensionality. We have X and Y and time. We have the number of bands of the satellite, which station indices, and all the other covariates that we have. So in the end, um, even though we're dealing with point data, which in this case is us to um, use also just local computers for processing this data. Um, but I needed to extract all these points data and then store that. Initially, I started actually only on Africa and at the African scale, it was okay to store the data in CSVs. But then once I got more covariates and I went to the global scale, that no longer scaled well, because if you're trying to save a float in a CSV, it's going to take so many bytes because it's just numbers, dot, and more numbers. If you're storing it in a binary format, it's going to be so much more efficient. So then the end, I switched from just saving CSVs from a regular data frame to using SF and then saving the output as a geo package. And that is quite convenient. Um, another very useful thing is that since this is a global data set and sometimes we don't need the entire data set, we only need some specific subsample of that. Um, we could also use SQL commands on the geo package and then that allowed us to really get the data much quicker. And in R it's very easy because SF also implements this SQL part to query. So that was a very nice improvement to the efficiency. So you use geo package for uh, No, for vector data. 
that was specifically because we have points and then in the points we sampled all the covariates. And for the heavy lifting, if we uh, wanted to run something on the actual rasters, um, this is more related to the second part actually, not so much to the first part. Um, but in any case, uh, we use Terrascope for this. So as I mentioned, the cluster that is uh, on Vito infrastructure and the Terrascope is actually very useful. It is a service provided to anyone uh, who wants to make use of Provo V satellite data. Uh, when you register, you get a virtual machine and the virtual machine is say like a laptop. It has four cores, eight gigabytes of RAM, one terabyte of hard disk space running CentOS 7.4, so nothing too special. But the important part for that is that it has direct access to all of the ProvoV data. So it's mounted as if it was a local directory and uh, access through NFS. So it includes access to the geometry, to the NDVI products themselves. It also includes access to the ARD and ARD plus and ARD plus plus that I mentioned before. And it also has some external data sets such as Aster data and Modus vegetation indices. Actually, these two were not there before, but uh, since I needed them, then they were quite happy to also download this data and uh, process it and include it in Terrascope. And then it has access to the Apache cluster, which is indeed the most important part. If you make something that runs on your virtual machine, the cluster is also running virtual machines that are very similar to what you get directly. So if it works on your virtual machine, it probably also works in the cluster. So then you create a Spark program, you run it locally on your virtual machine. If it works, you run it on the cluster and then hopefully everything goes well and then you get to use over a thousand cores. So yes, as I mentioned, the extracting took some time um, because indeed we have, even at the sampling rate of 0 0.2 degrees, the total number of points that we had was around half of a million. And that is really a lot of data to read. And there was no easy way to optimize it because you really need the entire time series of each of those points, which means you need to read every single image and even extracting several points from the same image is not so much faster because they are going to be stored in different blocks of the geotip that they're stored in. So it was just a very long process. So I did that using uh, GDAL via Bash and just using GDAL location info and then saving the result um, into XML files and then parsing the XML files in R. All right, so then the machine learning part. Um, I use a lot of different algorithms and I try to compare them and see which one works the best for the um, issue at hand. So I use both simple linear models as well as uh, complex machine learning algorithms. So the basic model that I tried is the general linear model, which is an extension to the linear regression, which allows to have multiple outputs, actually just a whole bunch of linear regressions put into one model. Um, then I compared that with fuzzy nearest centroid. So it's something that is related a bit to uh, k-nearest neighbors. So you have your feature space and the feature space, every, um, every class can have a weighted mean for each of the covariates. And then with the weighted mean, we say that this is the center of our um, our class. And depending on each pixel, how close the pixel and feature space is, to that centroid, uh, we assign it a particular membership amount. The closer it is, the more membership there is, so the higher chance that it is that class or it has a higher coverage of that class within the pixel. Then compared to that, uh, I also use logistic regression. It is a bit different from others in the sense that logistic regression only takes labels as an input and not um, and not really numbers. So we could only train this on pure pixels where we know that it is 100%. Um, and then um, in the end, that means that, yeah, maybe the training was not as optimal 
practice. It would be otherwise with models that can use multiple inputs and multiple outputs. But in R, there's not too many models that can actually handle these multiple inputs and multiple outputs that we need to uh, have one model to map all the line cover fractions. And actually, adjustment regression worked surprisingly well, even despite this limitation. Uh, then we also tried Lasso regression. So the idea here is that if we have a lot of covariates, then maybe it's better if we can drop some of the covariates that are not so important for the model. So Lasso does this regularization, so it automatically tries to determine which ones are best to drop. And I also use partial least squares regression, which is also a similar concept, but it is a bit more related to principal component analysis. Um, and in the end, what I found with all of these uh, linear models is that actually they're not really any better than just using a general linear model. So that means that all of the things that we were doing before to drop the covariates that are collinear, well, that was quite enough to regularize the uh, input. And then for the machine learning algorithms, I use random forests with the ranger package and then also artificial neural networks with the Keras package, Cubist, the Cubist package, and finally squirt vector machines with liquid SVM. So this one is interesting because normally in R, if you're trying to do something with support vector machines, you will have a reference to this E10 something something package that implements SVMs. Um, but I tried that, it was not very useful because it was too slow to train. So then I had to search for other packages and liquid SVM is an optimized package that is much, much faster than the other packages. And with that, I could actually train the model using the data set that I have. And then Keras itself is also interesting because uh, it's uh, implementing neural networks, but it's using actually Python. And the interface to Python is via reticulate, but the Keras package makes it very easy from R to interface with it. You just need to install um, a fund environment with Python and TensorFlow. And then you just tell the Keras package, this is how we found it. And then it just directly interfaces with it and runs the commands there. And TensorFlow itself is nice because it can make use of graphics cards and uh, that allows us to really accelerate the process very well. So I use a graphics card of my own that I was not really using for this purpose, just to make the calculations faster. And uh, yeah, the interface is actually pretty useful and pretty easy to do. Then there were also more machine learning algorithms that I tried but didn't really work out. So one is the multiple n, uh, multiple n number spectral mixture analysis. That's something that was very popular in the past for doing this sort of research. Um, but I found that it didn't really produce better results even than a general linear model, um, possibly because it does an assumption that the input should be a linear mix of uh, the different bands, for example. And in my case, I have all kinds of covariates that are really non-linearly related to the output. I also tried SuperLearner, which is a framework for Assemb assembling different machine learning models. Um, but that also did not work very well because it was too slow with the computer that I was using. Um, because it takes a long time to train the models and it needs to train several models and it needs to do cross validation on these models so that it would see under which conditions is it better to use one model versus another model. So it's effectively a model of models and then that really takes a very long time to train. So it wasn't really feasible with my data set either. And the last thing that I tried was multivariate random forest, because random forest is also an algorithm that only outputs one output in the regression. And I wanted to have one model that could take into account all of the data that I had in one go, rather than having it separately. For random forest, I had to do it separately. So there's one model that takes as input the a fraction of a particular line cover class and then tries to predict what is the fraction of that line cover class in each pixel. 
and then I would repeat that with every class, and then in the end I would normalize the results so that it adds to 100%. So at least in theory, it should be less effective than using um, a model that outright gives you all of the different classes with uh, it's summing up to 100%, just like uh, artificial neural networks does. Um, but in the end, the result was a bit surprising because uh, that was not what won. And random forest turned out to be the most accurate in this case. Uh, we achieved mean absolute error of 9.4 using the one step model and RMSC of 17.3. And then if we use this, uh, what I mentioned before, the fuzzy uncertainty confusion matrix, we can also get a kind of comparable estimate of how good our line cover map is uh, with overall accuracy and uh, and so on. So the overall accuracy in this case was 67 plus minus 4% because it's not certain how to allocate some classes sometimes. And the R squared or specifically the Nash subscript efficiency was 0 0.66 for uh, all of the classes combined. And then, as I mentioned, I was trying to also see what I can do about this issue of zero inflation. So I came up with an idea of uh, having a two-step model. So first, we have one step where we're trying to only model zeros and non-zeros, which is actually a binary classification task. And then for the places where we model that it's not a zero, then we have the regression task. So only those points will be um, put into the regression and then the regression will figure out if it's not zero, then what is it? And additionally, I had another idea for a three-step model, which is a bit different in the sense that the first model is also a binary model, but instead of seeing whether it's zero or not, it would figure out, is this pixel pure or not pure? So whether it is zero or 100, or whether it is somewhere in between. In that case, um, if it is a pure pixel, then we run a classification model and we try to classify which of the line cover classes this is. If it is a non-pure pixel, then we run as usual our regression task and then it figures out what is the amount of this line cover class in the pixel. This has a nice um, benefit over the two-step model in the sense that sometimes the two-step model and tries to predict zeros, it predicts that every single line cover class is zero. And then we cannot really tell what line cover class it is. And uh, the three step model doesn't have that issue. In addition, I also tried different types of voting for random forests. So by default, it's using mean voting. So it takes the um, predictions of every tree and then it takes the average out of that, which was indeed a problem for predicting zeros and hundreds because if we have pretty much anything that is not just predicting zero or 100, and we take an average of that, we will not get exactly zero or 100, which means we will always make at least some error from the real numbers. Uh, using medium voting is a bit better in that sense, because if at least half of the trees voted that this is zero or 100, then the result will be zero or 100. So we can predict those uh, better. And in the end, uh, when we use either median voting or the three-step model, it always decreased the mean absolute error by quite a bit. So here we can see that we got 7.9. And uh, we also got a higher overall accuracy of 72 plus minus 2%. However, it decreased the root mean squared error and also decreased the R squared or NSE. So what this means is that if we use these methods to better predict zeros and hundreds, what will happen is that in the middle, we have uh, fewer cases. So that means that sometimes if there's a mistake in the other models, let's see the purity model, and it misclassifies, this is a pure pixel, but it actually thought that this is not pure, then we will have some offset from where it actually should be. If it was the other way around and it was actually a pure pixel, but it predicted non-pure, then it will have 100% of a particular class. 
whereas it's actually some mix of different uh, land cover classes. And mostly we saw this issue in areas with a lot of heterogeneity. So if you have a place where even for experts, it's very difficult to tell, is this grasslands? Is this crops? Is this shrubs? Um, then the model is also not sure. And if we use just a regular one-step model, it will predict that, yeah, this is maybe 30% grass, 30% crops, and 30% shrubs. But the uh, median or three-step model, it will try to just guess what's the most likely of the classes, and it might just be completely wrong. Maybe it's actually grasslands, and then it predicted crops, and then it's completely wrong. So RMSC really uh, strongly um, penalizes for these really big deviations. So that's why you see an increase in RMSC. So we can look at this figure a bit more in detail. So you can see the different models. On the left is an intercept model, which is just something that I use as a kind of yardstick. So the intercept model is just trivial. It's saying, let's assume that everything has every single land cover class in equal proportions. So we would hope that any model that we have is better than the intercept model because that one is trivial and not really useful. Um, so we see that the general linear model is doing better than the intercept, but it's still the worst out of all the models that we have uh, otherwise. Sport vector machines was also doing not that better, um, but at least with NAE, it was doing uh, better than the linear model. Then Cubist and Random Forest were doing the best. Cubus was actually quite similar to random forests. Um, it was better at some of the classes and it was worse in other classes. So on average, random forest edged out um, compared to Cubus, um, but it was quite similar. And uh, we can also see that some of the classes are easy to classify and some of the classes are difficult. So for example, built up and water are generally easy to classify. Um, but that's not just because they are distinct classes, but also because we have global classification, which means that in a lot of places, there's no built up or inland water because they're quite rare classes. So actually a prediction of zero is a pretty good guess of what it is. So that makes it also easier to predict in that sense. Yes, and the uh, Herbaceous class was always the most difficult to predict because grass is everywhere, it's usually very mixed, and it's hard to really estimate how much of the grass is in a particular pixel. We don't have any uh, more um, information from what is within the pixel itself. Then from the covariates, uh, we found that the vegetation indices were by far the most useful ones for most of the classes. Not all of them, we can see actually quite a bit of a difference between the different classes. So for example, for shrubs, it was not that useful to have vegetation instances, but shrubs made use of all kinds of different information, including soil and climate information, as well as terrain and location covariates. So in the end, we found that we cannot really drop any of these um, covariates from the model further, simply because it helps to predict some kind of land cover class. And if we remove that, then overall, we also hurt our model. Um, but indeed, there was a really big difference in that the station uses and the information generally from the POV satellite was the most important and the other parts were not as important. And it's, yeah, we can also see patterns that we expected. For example, that for crop plants, soil information is really important because then you have soil, you can grow crops or you get crops. Um, for example, for inland water, it was fairly important to know terrain information because if you have water, it usually doesn't have slope. So then it will always be set to some NA value. And this is the map that we got in the end, the wall to wall map. And uh, in this figure, I'm showing all of the classes that we had. And the colors are not actually going from white to the respective color, but it is a measure of transparency. 
because everything always is up to 100%, then in this way, we can visualize all the classes at once. But of course, when there's a mix, then it's a mix between the different colors and sometimes it's a bit difficult to say what kind of mix it is. So it may look a bit similar to a hardened one color class map. And this is looking in more details into a particular, um, into particular classes. So shrubs, trees, and grass. So red is shrubs, green is trees, and blue is grass. You can see these spatial patterns where there's a gradient in between the different biomes and it just shifts from one to another. So for example, in Africa, you can see that the amount of grasses is highest in this area. And then when it goes further to the south, the amount of grass goes less, it transitions a bit to shrubs, and then from shrubs it transitions into trees. So this kind of information allows us to capture the reality much better because then we can really track how the gradient changes over space. And once we also have updating, we also can track how the gradient change over time. We can also track the small changes that do not correspond to an entire replacement of one length of type to another. Yes. So that was uh, it for this part. So do you have any questions about uh, what I've been presenting so far? Yes? Um, in the beginning you said um, uh, using the markers to, to account for this zero inflation. Mm -hmm. um, could you now explain how that is done? Or is it yeah, so this is, this is what I was mentioning. So the two-step and three-step models is the way that I did that, as well as for the median voting. So this is uh, the way to uh, try to, yeah. Yes. yes. The first idea that I had for that is indeed to make the two-step model to model the zero separately, which is a technique that is oftentimes used for zero inflated models. Okay, I'll check if anyone has questions also on Zoom. Okay, not so far. And then, um, yes? Sorry, how, how do you mean with uncertainty? Or, I mean, it's a bit like, um, I don't know what you say, you could say like uncertainty is accounted for because you have this fractional statistical approach, but it, it could be thought of differently than that. So then in a way, you would have this. Um, more yes, so that's a very good point. Um, we had indeed quite a lot of discussions about how to really determine uncertainty in these cases. Yeah, so what you're saying is true that in a way, if we have fractional information by itself, it's also can be seen as a probabilistic view. So the fractions can also be probabilities, and we also say the probabilities are oftentimes the proxy for the fractions. Um, if we use the median voting and this uh, two-step and three-step models, then we're actually looking at a different perspective, and there is actually trying to predict what is the most likely uh, blank cover in that area. So yeah, the way that um, we are doing that right now in the project for it is that we're looking at variability within the random forest model itself and seeing if the variability is high, then that means that a lot of the trees are predicting different things than other trees. And that means that it's not really certain about what the line cover actually is. And with that, we also had some troubles because um, it's not necessarily something that is comparable between different areas of the world because we also have this biome information so in each biome the in the project we are predicting separately so we have a model for each biome and then um, we have different hyperparameters even for the models for each biome and then the results don't really look good because over the different areas you have uh, different um, variability in the output. So we had to come up with 
a way to normalize those outputs so that they could be comparable between them. And so in the end, it's, it's also complicated even further for our land cover map because as I mentioned, we also have these expert rules that in case there's trees in the very far north, then we said that to something else. And then this is not something that we can also put any uncertainty measures to it. And then if we would set the uncertainty to NA in that case, then most of our world would become NA or very patchy, which is very complicated as well. So in the end, in the, in the project, we decided to go with an approach where we say whether it's high quality, medium quality, or low quality. So depending indeed on the variability of uh, the model and also on the input data quality. So whether we needed to fill in the data a lot, whether there were gaps in the data and so on. And uh, yeah, and also other ancillary data as well. <clears throat> Yes. But when you say I'm going to interpret probability, or I'm going to say probability to perfection, then you all just apply the text to Why would you actually argue with that? That argument there is an interesting conclusion for me. Yes, for sure. It's um, something that uh, is different between the different. Uh, resolutions and indeed when we will go to the 20 meter resolution that's going to be much different from what we have at 100 meter resolution for example at a uh, large scale we can look at forests but at the small scale we're looking at individual trees and then um, the nice thing also about fraction mapping is that for example if we map different types of forests say evergreen and needle leaf or yeah evergreen forests and deciduous forests we can get these uh, mixed forests just out of combining the different fractions. Um, and indeed, it's at the very fine resolution, then it's a question of whether that will work because we will see an individual tree, then yeah, maybe it's a bit different. This is also a big problem because our data is, as I mentioned, from the grid of uh, 100 pixels, well, some pixels of a pixel, if we go to 20 meters, then we actually only have a few subpixels to work with. So we don't even get the fractions, really. We only have like quarters or something. So yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a problem. So we'll need to look at that further. So how do you, how do you connect the data on Yeah, so did you do that from through uh, the measurement or from on the scale? No. Yeah, uh, it's the latter is using the um, very high resolution imagery from uh, public sources, so Google Maps and Bing, as well as from commercial satellites, such as uh, uh, Digital Globe, where the other data was not available. And they were also collecting uh, based on what time it was. So they also keep track of um, which year the imagery was for. So now when we have this updating of blank cover map, we also have information of which places have changed because they also keep track of what it was before and what it was after. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, that is a good question. Um, also quite surprised, but this is probably indeed related to this um, question of a probabilistic view because indeed um, logistic regression by default just gives labels and um, the NNET package also allows you to get the probabilities of each of these. So I was using the probabilities as the proxy and then the probabilities were actually pretty close mm. to what we see in the validation data. It was not the best model, but it was still like not any worse than the linear model. And it was trained, well, actually I was training it not just on the pure pixels, but I was training it on the, um, the dominant blank color class. So it was also taking into account these uh, things that are mixed, which 
should also confuse it, but apparently it was not that big of a deal. So yeah, it was surprising for me. Can you combine models to the model For the logistic model, I do not need to do that because indeed I specify all the labels and then the output is already the probabilities of each of the labels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly it's the multinomial, which is correct. Yeah. Okay. So, if there are no more questions, then we can go to the practical part. And this is going to be in Google Earth Engine. So, please go to this URL. You can also uh, find that URL in the, um, in the calendar of the open job. For the people in the chat, I will also put it in green. And then once you click on that, you should have this in your reader part. And then we'll say users boot time world open to help 2020. And you should have this make an LC map script. So what I will do is I will just go through the code and then afterwards we will have some time to play around with it so that you can try and create your own land cover um, maps from the land cover factions. So did you manage to get there already or not yet? Okay, good. So then how does this work? At the very beginning, you have the one import, which is the image collection of Copernicus global land cover layers collection two. So this data set is indeed our um, data set from the project. And it includes both the discrete classification, as you can see here, as well as the individual cover fraction. So you can see this cover fraction. It is with a percentage and um, goes up from zero to 100. And we have both the cover fractions and the standard deviation of the uh, of random forest outputs in this case. So it also shows a bit of the uh, reliability of the pixel. And yeah, we have also a class table for the discrete classification so we could get all the different colors, all the different length of maps. So the way that we do it is, well, this is selecting the first image from 2015. Um, this is for forwards compatibility because in the future we will have Line cover maps that are updated for every year. So it will just select the one from 2015, but at the moment we only have 2015. Then we have um, all the cover fractions because that's what we are interested in. We make those cover fractions into one image collection and they are set to the bands. Then we also select them specifically out of that so that it's a bit easier to work with later on. And then if you just run it, you will immediately get the visualization. So each of the layers is put into the layer box. By default, it is not, um, not selected. So you can see all the fractional layers, say tree cover. And this is showing how much tree cover there is in grayscale. So you can see the same patterns that, that the tropical forests are very um, strongly covered by trees and areas that are around it are not as densely covered by trees. And yeah, you can have that for every micro class that we have fraction for. Then this part is showing this legend here so it's not so important to look into that. That's just, uh, yeah, all kinds of rigid things to make this visible. 
we also have this helper function to help remap one value to another within a layer that has a discrete classification. So also not so important to see how it works. It just uh, applies a particular mask with a particular fill. I'll get back to that later. And then after this line, you can actually start uh, doing some um, changes. So the first thing that I have here is a naive dominant length over map. So it takes as an input the cover fractions. So this is what we made before. It's this one image collection that has all the different cover fractions as different bands. And then out of that, this whole thing is basically a re-implementation in Google Earth Engine of the R function which.max. So it takes the maximum, um, the highest uh, cover fraction, and then it returns the index of that. And in Google Earth Engine, it was a bit more complicated because we needed to uh, do that without such a function. Uh, it doesn't open for me with the link to provide. Oh, what does it say? Um, are you sure? No, this is Google Earth Engine. So Google Earth Engine is using its own kind of API and it is based on JavaScript. So, yes, it also has bindings in Python, but then you would also need to have a program that is actually written in Python with the Google Earth Engine bindings. So in this case, uh, the code that is written here is in JavaScript. But indeed, once you're a reader of a particular file, you can also just do things by yourself, write things in JavaScript. You'll see that JavaScript itself is not very complicated. Like, actually, Google Earth Engine isn't even using JavaScript too much because most of the things that it does is in the background, in the server. And the server doesn't really interact with JavaScript too much, so that uh, you just have a list of commands that then the translator layer changes into commands that the backend actually understands, and then the backend actually runs all this thing. That's why it also has the different bindings of Python and JavaScript. Um, so most of it is just using functions that you can find from the docs here, and those are really specific to Google Earth Engine. That's why it starts with an E. Uh, yes, so you can connect the output with R by downloading the results from Google Earth Engine and then importing those results into uh, R. And vice versa is also possible by exporting from R into uh, GeoTIFF and then importing that GeoTIFF in Google Earth Engine as an asset. So in the project that I had, um, we didn't really use Google Earth Engine. So what I showed there as our workflow that was, as I mentioned, all in Python. And in my case, for uh, comparing the different algorithms, it was an R. Um, we use Google Earth Engine afterwards because the Langcover map gets uploaded to Google Earth Engine so that it's easy for people to interface with it. And then we can also do these uh, post-processing calculations there if you want to 
to get something that is useful over the entire globe. Google Search Engine is very useful for these visualizations over the entire world. But it's very fast due to the way that it does the calculation over different uh, zoom levels. Yes, so if you want to explore the data, you do have a limit of how many pixels you can export. And if you try to export more, it will give you an error saying that the number of pixels has been exceeded. So what you can do is either lower the resolution or export a smaller area. Um, and it's also limited by the amount of space that you have in Google Drive, because by default, it just puts the TIFF file into your Google Drive. And also, it's best not to exceed four gigabytes because for some strange reason, Google Earth Engine is using general TIFFs and not big TIFFs. So it needs to split all the output into tiles of no more than four gigabytes. Yeah, so how this works is indeed we have the cover fractions as an input, then um, it uses the max reducer to uh, get the maximum value. And then here we have um, the sequence. Yeah, so these are all the band indices so that we can do this uh, which max thing. So we need to first have all the indices. Then the maximum index is obtained by using this way, um, it checks which of the cover fractions is equal to the maximum fraction. And then if it is, then it sets the output to the number of the index. And then everything is mosaic together. And then the original properties are copied from the image because um, otherwise we will would lose the same legend that we have here. Once we copy it, it's there. And we also remap the index values because now the indices are just from zero to nine. And we want it to be in these numbers that we have here because these are the code for the different blank or classes. And we also need to rename this into discrete classification because that's how the whole magic works. Um, if it's called discrete classification, then it will apply the color scheme. If not, it will not work. Yes, so this is how we then get this uh, um, max rule map. And we add it, and that's called dominant blank cover. So in your layers, you have this one. So you get this discrete classification map that is the dominant blank cover class map based on the cover fractions. And if you want, you can also compare that with the pre-made discrete map. So you will remember that we had the pre-made discrete map in the original data. So the discrete classification is just directly shown here in this map. You can see that there is some difference between the two. It's also mostly a difference in uh, the classes, because in the discrete map, they also show a bit more in detail what kind of forest this is by um, having a processing chain that includes more detailed uh, classification in some cases. And they also, of course, include more rules in the pre made map of the export rules compared to just the dumb and map. Yes. And then uh, afterwards, there is an example of custom rules. So what can you do with it? Instead of just using the dominant line cover class, you can use some additional special rules. So we just start with a mask and filter, which is just needed later on for applying these rules. And the rules themselves are this. So this part is the rule itself. So in this case, for example, we say if urban is greater than 10, then we should consider it to be completely urban. So then we map all of the pixels 
that have urban greater than 10 as urban. So 50 is the number for urban, as you can see here. So we do the remap of the original image. And yeah, we replace everything that is greater than 10 in urban with 50. And then this part is just so that we can continue adding more rules. And next, for example, we check is permanent water above 10. If so, we set it to 80, which is permanent water. Then we look at wetlands. We can say wetlands is something that we consider to be grass that is larger than 50 and water that is seasonal greater than 10. So then we remap those areas and set the class to 90, which here we can see will appear as herbaceous wetland 90. And then in this case, I also did a simple thing where let's say we don't care about shrubs, we only care about grass. So then uh, I checked whether the sum of shrub and grass is above 50. And if it is, then map that to grass, which is 30. And then in the end, we just return the uh, masks and filtered object, which just has those pixels replaced. And then I ran that. And then this is what you see in the layers as map with custom rules. You can see that these are slightly different. So with the custom rules, we now have less forest and we have a lot more urban. So, yeah, because we had the urban rules, so now we see much more urban. We also see more water. We also have the water rule. Yeah, you can see much more water here and much more urban. And you can see also the remapping of the shrubs in the cross. Yeah, so this is not doing any classification. This is creating a customized map from the cover fractions. So the cover fractions themselves tell us how much of each line cover there is in each pixel. And in this case, we are just uh, hardening that fuzzy classification into one discrete line cover map. This is useful, for example, um, if you're only interested in some applications, let's say you're interested in urban areas. In general, if you don't apply any special rules, the urban areas are quite small. You might think that they are underestimated. They're not really underestimated, but they seem to be little because urban areas usually are not dominant because urban areas usually are surrounded by trees and grass and so on. So it's very rare that they would form the actual dominant land cover class. So that's why it's useful to have these rules where we say if it's more than 10% of urban, then let's consider this to be urban because we want to know where that urban area is. So using these custom made maps, you can really tweak the um, land cover map that you get to your own um, needs, depending on what needs you have, what land cover classes you're interested in. And you can also create these complex classes, like in this case, we had um, wetlands. If we have grass more than 50 and seasonal water more than 10, we can combine all these rule sets together into forming new classes, which might be of interest for us. And then this part here is also another example. This is from Vito themselves um, using the same kind of idea to create or to take our line cover uh, classification map and to try and make it similar to the Korean line cover classification map, which is done by a completely different group. And it is originally only for Europe. Um, they also have a different definition of classes and so on. But since we have these uh, line cover fraction layers, 
uh, we can translate those layers into the legend that they have. And they did something that they called Korean light or pseudo Korean, where they created a set of line cover classes that would be common to both our map and their map, and then set the rule set to be the same as they're using in their map. And so if you see the layers here, you can also use the discrete green lights. And then it will also show what's the difference between the dominant line cover map and that one. And actually, the difference isn't really that big. You can see that here there are some changes, but actually they're fairly similar. Yeah. And this is also because um, I'm still using this discrete classification color scheme, which is not exactly the one that they use for Korean lights. So, um, there's another one. If you look at my presentation, I can show it. The very end, there is this one, um, extra code or inspiration. Uh, this is made by V2 themselves. And here they go more in depth about how they create this pseudo Korean map out of the discrete layers. And there you also have this ability to compare between the two maps with a slider, as well as uh, to see what's the difference if you just put them together and do a difference, whether it's the same line color class or if it's different for the discrete classification. Yeah. So then you can just uh, play around with this. So you have uh, these example rules of green lights if you want to have some inspiration. You can also just uh, try to add some custom rules to the custom rules block or remove some and see how it changes the map. So that's uh, what we have the next 30 minutes for. Okay, Compound also has a question. Um, have all the products been validated? Um, generally, yes. We have um, a validation group that is here in Wageningen University. And specifically, we are working to make sure that we know how good the map is. So we're using our validation set that I mentioned. And with the validation set, we can tell how good the maps are. Actually, we don't even know that much about the map when it comes into um, Wageningen. They just send some maps and they ask us, how good is the map? And then uh, we look at the map and then uh, we do the statistics and calculations and then we say, is this better or it's worse than the previous map that they had? And this is also how they can optimize a bit their um, workflow without ever having any of the validation data that always stays with us. And we also have now this spatial uh, map of uh, how good the predictions are, not just in those point locations that we have the validation data for, but also overall. So first we tried to apply Krieging for that, but that took a very long time, especially at a global scale. Um, then geographically weighted regression that worked better. And in the end, the latest idea that we had was to actually make use of machine learning to try and predict how well the map does in all the areas in the world, which is also interesting because then you have a, a model that is trying to predict how well the map works. The model itself can have uh, some uncertainties. So you have uncertainties of uncertainties. It's uh, yeah, interesting work. And you can uh, find the papers about that. Uh, they're published now, I believe. And they will be available together with the uh, third iteration of the global line cover map. So you will be able to find the links directly together with it on its release in a few weeks.
open up the brand And I can also show the LC viewer. So if you go to lcviewer.vito.de, you can see the land cover viewer for the product. And on the left side, you can see that you can switch also between the um, discrete classification and the fractional classification. And depending on what you want to see, you can select it and then zoom in and zoom out. And also, if you put the mouse for the Classification on something, it will tell you more in detail what this is. And we also have the false color composites for the different um, fraction maps, so you can also explore that a bit more. So it's kind of like what we have on the Earth engine, just uh, made in an easy way. And then we also have the statistics button, so that um, you can say how much of each of the line cover classes is in a particular area that you're looking at. And you can even compare the different countries. So you can compare the Netherlands with Belgium, and then we can see that the Netherlands has fewer forests, so that's not very surprising. And more problem.
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So at the very top, you have the search bar, search places and data sets. So if you want to import something, you just search for that, and then there's a button to add. Like you search for Landsat. And then you have import, and then this adds it to the database. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the 21 at the moment. So the, the script categories that we get from the uh, length of a map, here you can also see that it depends on what you select. Single class forest, open and close forest. If we do that, then we have separation between those. And also all forest types. So it includes all these different kinds of forests. Um, this is made so that um, relates a bit to the validation part. We do have most of the classes validated, but we do not have any validation data for the forest types because when the um, training and validation data were collected, they were only collected with just the generic trees and not a particular type of forest in mind. So that means that we don't really have a good idea of how accurate our forest classification is, but um, we're providing that anyway because at least visually it seems pretty good and it's probably useful for some users. Um, but we also just default to saying it's just forests so that we're on the safe side.
Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you export them? Yes, there is um, export in the docs, and there's export image and to drive. Usually, that's the one that you use because that will export to your Google Drive. And then you just say what image do you want to export, and then. The rest are actually optional. Usually, you also want to specify the resolution, the scale. And then, once you do that in the tasks, there will be a new thing that appears, and then you need to click on run. And then the processing will start. And then it will either succeed or it will say, Sorry, you have too many fixes. Try again. <laughs>
Are there any other questions? Because in two minutes, it's already lunch time. Yes, sure. Have the library of parse, and then this is the um, options. Just make an option parser, and then we add options to the parser. And then this is pretty intuitive. You say, was the short version of the option? Was the long version of the option? Was the type that you expect when you read the option? So the value after the option is saved as a character in this case. Was the default value if they don't specify anything and then the help is the, the string that gets printed when you write dash dash help and then the this meta var is just how do you want to call it like dash i and then what's afterwards you can use the same as type but it can also be something more specific like path and then in the end yeah you just get out of the parser um, you have args, and then this args, parse out. Um, this args has all of these as a list. So if you take input directory, that's the same as this one. So the option after input directory or after i will get put into the args input directory value. And then this you can just run from dash directly with dot slash. If at the top you put this. This would be an end of our script. Or if you don't have those, then you can run our script space and then the the file and then space and then all the arguments or dash dash help. There's no more questions, then uh, thanks for being here and uh, let's go for lunch. And afterwards, I will present about the second part, the DFAST analysis, time series break detection, and how we can update these dumb color maps for the upcoming years. Thanks. Um.